set this panel up as a um, set of perspectives on big data. And of course, we didn't plan it this way, but I was really struck, I think, by the, the contrast between some of the, the more technology talks this morning, which really focused on all the interesting research that's gotten done, um, and then all the questions that the panelists were coming up with as people try and apply all these nice technologies in the real world. Yeah, I, I think it was interesting to me how we're seeing questions about how do I validate the data? How do I validate the decisions? You know, what does it mean? Where do I find a little set to get started with? Um, uh, you know, what are the policies? You know, for God's sake, not the, the, the sexy research question anyone is ever going to deal with tomorrow. But you know, in terms of making this all work in the real world, we need the policies. We need some clarification on how long I save the data, where it all comes from, what I do with it. Okay, so I wanted to say thank you for everyone for sharing your perspectives. I think we raised more questions than answers today. but. Perhaps that's what we'll be answering next year. So, okay. so we're going to close out today. Um, I wanted a second keynoter that would send us out with a bang, and I thought we could not possibly do better than using James Whitaker for, the <laughs> <Wow. laughs> for that. Yeah. Uh, James is an advisory board member and a past author in IEEE software. Uh, he's, again, one of these folks that goes back and forth between industry and academia. Um, he was an early thought leader in model-based testing. His PhD became a standard reference on the topic. It turns out I knew two of his three dissertation advisors, it turns out. Uh, as a professor at the Florida Institute of Technology, he founded the world's largest academic software testing and security research center. Uh, since then, he's been at Microsoft and then Google as an engineering director for Chrome and Google Plus, back to Microsoft again. Uh, his books include How to Break Software, How to Break Software Security, How to Break Web Software, I give you James. All right. Thank you very much, Forrest. Well, uh, welcome to my home. I don't actually live in this building, but I live, uh, I might as well. Um, I've been in Seattle for about, I don't know, eight years or so, and people always say the weather sucks. Not this time of the year. Uh, I think we kind of have it on most of the world uh, for about four months in the summer, and then it's pretty much shit after that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I should warn you, I don't do the G-rated thing so well, um, uh, but I'll try, I guess. Uh, any talk that has to do with the future must start with a quote from Arthur C. Clarke. It's a rule of mine. And, and unless it's not a good future. If it's a, if it's a bad future, it's a quote about zombies or something like that. But if it's a good future, if it's a magical future, it should involve uh, uh, something from Arthur C. Clarke. And there's a lot of things that mankind has invented that fits this definition of magic of Clark, right? There's a bunch of them up there. But there are two that stand out by some stretch, and perhaps not for the reason that you think they might stand out. And I know this is going to sound like some Microsoft guy trying to sell you a PC, but the PC is one of them. And maybe not for the reason you would expect. And the other is the internet. Now, I'm going to talk about this and talk about why. But the reason I bring this up in the first place is because both of these two inventions, the two most important tools of mankind, are right now undergoing massive evolution and transition. It's a perfect storm of innovation. It's going to change the way we do things today. It's going to change the way we do things tomorrow. And it's going to change how everything works over the next couple of decades. So I want to talk about this, and I want to start kind of in the past, because the personal computer changed everything. It wasn't that the PC was more powerful than the mainframe. It wasn't that the PC was better than the mainframe. It was that the PC democratized the knowledge of this tool. The PC took this machine that used to exist in the back rooms of universities and some government labs and some large companies that you had to buy time on, you had to trade time on, you had to wait to get access to it, and to put it on everybody's desk. Everybody's desk. Right? Microsoft had a, this audacious goal to put a PC on 
uh, every desk and in every home running Microsoft software, right? And they, and they did it. Um, and we solved some amazing problems with this tool. The one I think sort of defines the decade of the 90s, which was the heyday of the PC, are these two guys and the problem that they discovered. DNA. This is Crick and Watson, and this is their discovery. Now, back in 1953, when they made this discovery, they modeled DNA in this double helix structure with what appears to be Lincoln logs. Now, Lincoln logs aren't the most expressive of technologies, and despite mankind knowing and the scientific community knowing that this was an important discovery, this was the building blocks of, of, of us, we really did very little with it in the 50s. And the 60s passed, doing very little with it, right? Small discoveries, small insights. Because experimentation and the knowledge to actually do something with DNA didn't yet exist. The tools in the hands of the people who knew about this were too few. 70s passed, the 80s passed, and it wasn't until the 90s. It wasn't until the scientific community had the tool of the PC, understood how to use it, that there were a lot of people who could program it. There were a lot of people who could use it as a modeling medium. There were a lot of people who understand it. At the very least, the people involved in the Human Genome Project in the 1990s were super users. And progress accelerated. By 1998, we could map, we could sequence the genome of an arbitrary human being. Not an or inert organic substance, not a laboratory rat, a human being, the most complex biological entity that we know, and we could model it. And in 1998, it was quite expensive to model. It was about 93, 94 million dollars. Very few people could afford to get their genome uh, sequenced. But by 2003, thanks to this magic, it cost a much less. And in, by, in 2003, by the way, the Human Genome Project was canceled. It was canceled because it was finished. We were done. We met all of our goals. And now today, in 2013, it cost about seven grand to get your genome sequenced. Seven thousand dollars. We can afford this. We all have jobs that will pay for this. If you only want the important bits sequenced, that only costs a few hundred dollars. Right? This is serious magic. This is taking one of mankind's hardest problems and solving it so completely that the U.S. government doesn't even fund it anymore. <laughs> now, these things, these computers, these personal computers are evolving, and we all know it. We all have PCs because we're in the industry. Apparently, there are people who aren't buying them, right, because there's fewer, fewer of them being sold. They've evolved into something a little bit different. They've evolved into cell phones and uh, smartphones and tablet computers and things that begin with I, right? And, but all of these things are designed and programmed on a PC. And what they've done is they've kind of changed the game a little bit. It used to be that when you wanted to do something, you had to go to your computer and say, hey, computer, I want to do something. And if it was a complex something that you wanted to do, you had to break it down into a bunch of little somethings. Right, if your intent was, okay, I'm out of shape, uh, or like the French guy drinking wine, right? He just wants to drink more wine, right? I want to find something to cancel out the wine that I drink, which is basically why I exercise. But let's say I decide I want to become a runner. Now, before this one PC evolved into all these little devices, I would have to go to my PC and say, I want to buy running shoes, right? That's my intent. And then I want to buy maybe some clothes that I can run in. And then um, I want to, I don't know, do some other things right to run. I want to find local trails. I want to find local 5Ks. I want to do all these things. But when you go to your computer and say, I want to buy running shoes, what does your computer do? Right? What does your search engine do? It helps you buy running shoes. And then it says, okay, this guy wants shoes. He's interested in running shoes. And despite the fact that you just bought the damn things, it suggests days later, hey, running shoes are on sale over here. Running shoes, running shoes, running shoes, running shoes. Right? Because it only understands that one, one intent. But now... 
<laughs> but do females buy that many running shoes or just shoes in general? You do. Okay. I tell you what, I will admit right now, on film, I don't understand females. <laughs> Um, so, so now, though, we can take a much more complicated intent to a computer. We can actually say, I want to be a runner. Because when we run, we go with our phone. And now I can follow this runner around. I know what shoes you bought. I know what clothes you bought. I know where you live. I can suggest local trails. I can suggest, suggest 5Ks. Maybe a little bit later, I can suggest uh, half marathons and marathons. We can get smarter about this. We can take, instead of the human having to break down these intents and keep going to the computer with them individually, we can have long running intents. We can be with you the whole way, right? This changes the game, and I'm going to show you some serious magic that we can do with this. So here we have one of mankind's most important discoveries, and it's evolving right now into something even bigger. Now, if that wasn't enough, we have the internet. The other thing that's really important that, uh, that is also evolving. So let's talk about that for a second. Now, the internet, click. The internet is this sort of, you know, magically cool uh, thing that changed the game. The PCs were, were really at the end of their road, right? Their hard drives weren't big enough. The data that we needed wasn't on them, it wasn't on our local network, and the internet came along and solved that problem for us. All of a sudden, it wasn't just our device, it was everyone else's device that we could access. And it wasn't just our data, it was everyone else's data that we can access. And we did some important things in this decade, too. This is the decade of the 2000s. And I think this one is, I think, sort of the signature problem that we solved with the internet. Because what the internet did is it allowed collaboration. Instead of some lone scientist in Seattle, Washington, working on some problem, that lone scientist could connect with other lone scientists in Algeria or Germany or the United Kingdom or Scotland or France, right? And people who were interested in the same problem could get together, they could share data, they could share code, and they could work together to solve problems that they couldn't solve before. We couldn't solve the human genome without the PC. We couldn't solve extrasolar planetary finding without the internet because that's when it really took off. In 2003, because in the past, we thought they were out there, man. We saw them, right? Look, we see that. See that? There's a wobble. That planet is wobbling. That's got to be something else. But it wasn't until the internet where we could share data, we could look at data. People in the southern hemisphere and the nor northern hemisphere and the part of the sky that they actually share around the equator, we could look at the data 24-7, thousands of people involved, and in 2003 we found the first planet orbiting around Gamma Cephei. Not it's probably there, not the data appears to indicate it's there, it's there. We know what it's made of. We know how big it is. We know what it, what it, how, how, it, how it orbits this binary star. And then another, and then another, and then another. And throughout the decade of the 2000s, last time I checked, we were approaching 1,000 identified extrasolar planets. Not possible without scientists and amateurs across the globe collaborating on shared data set, looking at each other's results, and sharing code. These are literally, the internet and the PC are literally opposable thumbs for the human brain. They make us better. It's not that as tools they were that amazing, even though they were. What they did is they raised the sea level of humanity's capabilities. They made us smarter. They made us super learners. I've got a kid in high school now. He's learning things I didn't learn until I got into college. High school is a new college, thanks to the PC, and thanks to the internet. He's studying things I couldn't imagine having to study as a 15-year-old. He brings home his math homework. I minored in math, right? He's in the ninth grade. And he's showing me his math homework. I'm thinking, man, your mom's got to be home soon. <laughs> so, um, so this is what we've done, right? Opposable thumbs for the human brain. 
and both of them right now, the personal computer and the internet are evolving. Now the internet's evolving in I think a really interesting way. Perhaps even more interesting than this PC to devices evolution that we're going on to, right? Turns out that this internet thing, right? The killer app for the internet over the last decade and a half has been search. Guess what happens when you search for a decade and a half? You find a bunch of shit. <laughs> and what happens when you find something? You don't have to search for it anymore. It's there, right? You don't search for something you've already found. It's there. You know it. You don't have to search for it again. Unless, of course, you monetize search, then search your way. So this is what's happening. We have PCs tethered to desks that have been unleashed on the world. The sphere of intent is no longer to the case that we have to go to the computer and ask it for help. It knows because we carry it in our pocket. We put it in our purse. We put it in our bag. We have it in our lap. We have them in our hands. That sphere of intent is following us everywhere we go. And it's really changing the game. And it's not searching anymore. It knows. All that stuff we found doesn't have to be found again. We've gone from an era of tethered PC to a sphere of intent that encompasses the entire world. From an internet of information to an internet of knowledge. So what can we do when we combine this evolution of the PC into devices and this evolution of the internet from information to knowledge? Well, let's go through an example and then a couple examples and then I'll sort of put it all, all together after, after that. So this is an email, an actual email I got from my daughter, although that's not actually my daughter and that's not actually my daughter's name. Uh, Microsoft legal people thought it was a bad idea. Uh, in fact, they just told me I couldn't uh, put her picture or her name on there. Uh, because when my daughter said, oh, I hear you're talking about me in one of your talks, and she looked at it and she said, ooh, I would never wear my hair like that. So anyhow, I have a 19-year-old daughter, and I get this email from her, and she said, Dad, there's this cool band playing at this place in, in downtown Seattle, you want to go together? Because I think I mentioned one time when I, was, I borrowed her car and I, thought, I said, hey, that, you know, I really dug that playlist. That was really cool. And so maybe she saw this as an opportunity to get me to pay for her to go to this concert. I don't know. But anyhow, I'm 47. She's 19. This is pretty cool, right? 19-year-old daughter asking her 47-year-old dad out. I mean, what dad wouldn't say, yes, honey, let's go? Actually, I'm the dad that wouldn't say, yes, honey, let's go. Because I tell you what, I couldn't sit through a concert of Justin Bieber or anybody who's ever sung on American Idol for an hour. I don't care who I'm with. I just couldn't do it. So I have some work to do. Here's an email with intent written all over it. Hey, daddy, let's go see them here. And now I have to figure out can I tolerate this band for three hours, even being with my daughter? Uh, and where the hell is the Paramount Theater? There are certain places in downtown Seattle I don't go. Where do I park? Where are we going to eat? How long is it going to take to get there? It's a lot of work here. Got to go buy the tickets. Where do I want to sit? Blah, 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 blah. Now, fortunately, that's the old way. Here's an intent. It occurs in email. Go out to the web, go out and find an app, go out and do some work, and then enjoy the concert. So here's the way it works now. It's a little thing called the Action Broker, and what I've done is I've clicked on it and I've asked, show me the entities in here. Does Bing know about anything in this email that it can help me with? And Bing circled two things, of Monsters and Men, which is the name of the band, and the Paramount Theater, which is the name of the venue, right? Those are the things that Bing found over its 15 years of searching. So I click on the band of Monsters and Men. Sounds kind of like a funny name. I don't know. Um, and I get what is called the Bing Entity Card. Right? This is the stuff that Bing knows about this band. Didn't have to go out to the web to get it. I didn't have to install an app to get it. I'm sitting here in office 
happy where the, where, right where the intent occurred. This is where I'm doing my research. And so it turns out this band has a great story. First of all, they're from freaking Iceland, right? I mean, who the hell's from Iceland? I mean, I know there's people there. And they have an airport. Occasionally, when I'm going to Europe, they want me to go, you know, Expedia says, hey, Iceland. Um, but I mean, I've never met anybody from Iceland. This is kind of cool. And there's like a whole bunch of them, and they can sing. Not only that, this band from Iceland went to Europe for the Battle of the Bands. There's like 500 bands involved in this. It's really high prestige. And they kicked ass. They won the thing. I mean, how cool is that? Not only are they from Iceland, they won something. This is great. And then I listen to their music, right? Right here, because I can listen to the music. I can buy the music. Oh, my God. The woman who sings, maybe she has a lot of shoes, too. I don't know. But she's like, she's like Chrissy Hind and Janis Joplin vocal cords just mashed up and put together. And heaven comes out of this woman's voice. She can sing, they can rock, I'm getting excited. And fortunately, there's a buy tickets link here and I can go directly to Ticketmaster. I don't have to go to the web or to an app either. Now, the venue. Is this venue someplace that I want to go to? Well, it turns out it's a block from I-5. That's my, my idea of going to downtown Seattle, right? Surrounded by parking, it's close enough to the library that you can park, you know, basically for free and lots of great restaurants uh, around there and sure enough I can click here and buy tickets right from uh, right from the venue and so this is the experience that we expect now and by the way it puts all the dinner reservations and everything right into my calendar driving directions are there everything's there because I don't know if people from Microsoft if my phone doesn't tell me to be there I won't be there right it's not on my Outlook calendar it's not, you know, anyhow. Uh, that's the experience. So what just happened here? What happened was we took an intent that appeared in an email. And instead of having to go out to the web or go out and find the app, because the app hasn't really helped anything, right, has it? The, the, you still have to go out and find the app, just like you have to go out and find the information on the web. And there's always some guy who's got a better app than you. It always pisses me off. You see somebody on something, so, hey, we're, 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 that's cool. You know, and then, oh, there's another damn app. Now I've got 150 on my phone instead of 149. And then when I need it, I can't find it on my damn phone. So, so this is better, right? Intent is resolved where intent occurs. Now, there's another concept here I want to uh, introduce you to. Oh, by the way, that's me and my daughter with our tickets. And that's the Paramount Theater where we got to stand in line. This is such a cool venue. So I think one of the oldest theaters in, in, uh, in Seattle. I know there are Europeans in the, office, uh, in the audience. And whenever an American says it's something that's old and refers to an old building, it's like, yeah, right. We have apartment buildings eight times older than your oldest building in Seattle. I'm sorry, but it's old to me. And it's really beautiful. And it was really cool. And there's the band. Uh, we partied like crazy. I don't know if my daughter turned 47 or I turned 19 during uh, that, that time, but it was, it was absolutely stunning. And that woman plays that trumpet or trombone or whatever the heck that horn is that she's got back there uh, like an absolute angel. If you've never heard this band, I highly recommend them. I will see them anywhere they come now. So um, this concept of a super app. Now, super apps aren't the apps you go out and download. It's not the top app from the app store or the app market or whatever we call these things. It's where you are now, right? Email. If you're an email, email's a super app. Uh, your social network, Facebook, Twitter, right? These are super apps. Skype, it's a super app. These are apps where people spend a lot of their time and where a lot of latent intent occurs anyway, right? There's a lot of intent in Facebook. There's a lot of intent that goes back and forth in email. Hey, let's go do something. OK, what do you want to do? Where do you want to do it? Who's going to get reservations? Right? This is an intent stream, and it occurs in a super app. So the important thing here, lots of users, lots of intent. Now, what we want to do is we want to take the functionality to the user. Don't make them go get it. Take them to, if the intent occurs in a super app, that's where we want to resolve it. 
Now the second thing, and this is where, this is my plea for you data owners. Stop allowing companies like the one I used to work for and the one I currently work for extract all the value from your data. Right? What we have is we have a bunch of people who own data who are allowing other people to monetize that data. I propose something a little different. I propose a stock market, a, a spot market. I propose a gathering of value providers and value consumers who can get together and negotiate a deal. Right? This is a value-based auction. I have something of value, something that you want. Let's talk. Right? Because it turns out that information may not be valuable. And in fact, it may be that advertisements are the best way to monetize information because there's not a bunch of latent value in information. But knowledge? Not so much. Knowledge is valuable. Knowledge is information that we, it's the stuff we found, right? It's not the stuff we have to search for anymore. And it's valuable enough for people to pay for. So let me give you another example of this super app and spot market, and then we'll talk about uh, more specifics during the example. So let's say you decide you need a vacation. Now, where, what super app is involved in this? What's the first thing you do when you decide, ah, I got a trip to make? Maybe it's a business trip, maybe it's a vacation, doesn't matter. What is the, the place? Where is the super app involved here? Now, I propose that super app is a calendar. Because the first question you have to ask yourself when you decide, okay, I'm going on a vacation, maybe Hawaii sounds nice, you go to your calendar and decide when you go. Your calendar, your spouse's calendar, your kid's soccer calendars, right? All of these things, okay, maybe what, what's a good week, right? And so, if you, once you find that week, now you stop, right? Now as in now, 2013, you stop. You go to the web or you go to some travel app, right? You leave the place where the intent occurred and you go off somewhere else and do a bunch of work. Now, I contend that in travel, particularly, not only do you start that transaction in your calendar, you end it in your calendar too, because once you go book all that stuff, you copy it to your calendar so that your phone can tell you where to be. Maybe that's just a Microsoft thing, but if my, you know, somebody says, oh, you were late to the meeting, I'll pull out my phone and say, what meeting? Show me where I was supposed to be that I wasn't. All right, so you start in the calendar, you end in the calendar. Let's, why not just keep it there? So what would a transaction like this look like? So first of all, that's the week, clear my calendar. Um, and that's easy enough to do, right? Even a computer can do that for me, just decline all the meetings. But it's interesting, though, if there's a meeting that is really important, I've done this before. I, I, in fact, when I was a Google employee, I got in trouble with my boss. I, I scheduled a trip over his staff meeting. And I was in an airplane when the staff meeting was happening, and this was before they had Wi-Fi on airplanes. And by the time I landed, I had all these angry emails. Where are you, where are you, where are you? I scheduled a trip, I didn't know. Right, because I scheduled a trip in Expedia, and Expedia doesn't know what's on my calendar. Uh, so here I'm scheduling a trip in my calendar. Those sorts of things won't happen. Now look at what happens when you do this. This is when you know you've got a bona fide super app on your hand. Isn't this a wonderful interface for scheduling travel? Now there's some personalization things that are going on here. Um, you know, I tell my travel agent I like nonstop flights, they know I've got status on Delta and Alaska. So if, there's, if it's less than 50 bucks, don't even bother giving me a, an American or a British Airways or something like that. I'm willing to pay 50 bucks for Delta or Alaska because that's I'm likely to sit up, more likely to sit up front you know, for that 50 bucks than I am in all those other ones, right? So you can imagine some personalization scenarios in here as well. But look at the layovers. The layovers pop. You ever find yourself doing layover math? Right? Because you just see it as a string of, oh, okay, here it, it lands at this time and it, it lands and you're like, okay, is that two hours? That's just under two hours or is it just under? Oh, you, know, you have to do all that math in your head, right? And overnighters just pop. There's a red eye there. It's obvious it's a red eye. Double connection. It's obvious it's a double connection. Right? I've, got, I've had visitors in my house a few weeks ago and and they swore they were leaving at 11 a.m. until we got to the airport and realized they booked a flight for 11 p.m. Um, not with this interface, right? So, so sometimes 
the, the super app and the scenario that you're implementing within the super app, it's just like this match made in heaven. And I think this is one of those cases. So uh, we can just click on one, and that's it, right? Click on it, and it's booked. Reservation numbers are there, confirmation numbers are there, seat preferences, all that stuff is taken care of. If you want to edit it, you don't go to the airline's website, you go to your calendar. That's where every, all the magic happens. Now, we don't have to stop there. What we have here is an intent signal. What we have, let's go back a second. What we have here is a really strong intent signal. This isn't, this isn't some guy in Maine dreaming of a Hawaii vacation. This is a guy who works at Microsoft with a family of four. He makes good money, and he's coming to your hometown. Wouldn't you like to know about that if you sold stuff in that town? So you could start with hotels. Who wants this guy? Strong intent signal. He's coming. He's booked the flight. Give him a deal. Now here's where I think, why are we allowing these big companies to run this auction? Why isn't the local chamber of commerce taking this? Why aren't the local chamber of commerces in every single city on the planet pissed off that they're the ones that own all this data and big search companies are the ones making money on it? I'll include mine in this. Why? And we're in, my friend and I, um, we've both, both been uh, at Google and we're both now at Microsoft. Um, he clings to his Android phone. I've got my Windows phone. We're walking in downtown Bellevue. And Bellevue, have you, you all seen Bellevue, right? Bellevue's just down the road there. The word affluent comes to mind uh, whenever I walk through Bellevue. And we're searching uh, for burgers. And I searched using Bing. He searched uses using Google. First thing on Bing was Burger King, <laughs> right? OK. I'm being recorded. I'm going to be kind. <laughs> the first link on Google, page rank, was a steakhouse in New York City. <laughs> being recorded, I'm going to be kind. He and I are, are one and a half blocks from this place, this little piece of heaven in Bellevue called the Lunchbox Laboratory. They have this burger called the dork, right? Not, I mean, it's, it's right down the street from Microsoft. Not only is the name perfect, it's duck and pork. <laughs> Ground up and grilled to just, oh. <laughs> then they didn't know about it, right? Bellevue Chamber of Commerce knows about the Lunchbox Laboratory and the dork sandwich. You got to try the dork. If you're in Bellevue, go to the Lunchbox Laboratory, try the dork. Uh, it, it is literally to die for. Right? I don't know why they don't just provide free Wi-Fi, proxy the thing, and take control of their data. Right? They know the companies that are paying taxes. They know the companies that are, they know everything about those companies. Anything about those companies changes. They're the first ones to know. Why they don't run these spot markets, I don't know. But this is what the hotel spot market li might look like. I can go click through here, find one I like, book it, and I'm done. Right? That's it. Right, this is the age of knowledge. This isn't the age of information. And then we go even further. Here are some local attractions. Right, this is a spot market run by now. How does placement occur on this? Well, you know, the auctioneer is going to take a, a slice. People are going to bid on this. I propose a value-based au uh, auction. Right? I want the one that is the best deal to the user. Not the one who paid the auctioneer the most, but the one that's willing to give the biggest discount to the user. I'll put you first. Right? And if it works out and you get clicked on a lot and people like you and you get good ratings, we'll, we'll keep you first. Right? Value of the user trumps money to the auctioneer in my mind. But this is me designing this. Um, and, and so you can go click through here. You can find some things that you might enjoy. You can put them on your calendar. Um, there's all kinds of things that we're working on with this app. Put, looking at the, you book the hotel. We'll, we'll drag all the activities for the kids out of that, put them on your calendar, and that way you won't, you won't miss anything. And so what you end up with is, is a calendar at the end of it that looks like this. 
right? Without ever leaving your calendar, you were able to plan your entire trip, right? This is a super app. It's not something that you have to go out and get as a user. We bring the functionality to where the user is. Meet the users where they are. And the users do spend time in super apps. They spend a lot of time. That's where they spend most of their time. And you'd be surprised if you're the owner of one of these super apps. I gave this talk at Facebook a few weeks ago. If you're the owner of one of these super apps and there's intent flowing through it, pretty silly not to, not to try to do something with it. Now here's another one. A friend of mine who lives in San Francisco and his wife has this, uh, he, he calls it endearing habit and he pronounces it pretty much just like that. This endearing habit of putting date night reservations on his calendar, right? And so that's it. That's all he gets. Date night. Expectation? Dazzle me, right? So this guy is a Microsoft programmer, and so he coded this thing. Uh, these are called office apps. They, there's a programming model. Um, you write them in HTML and JavaScript, and they run within Office. Um, and so he wrote this office app for live music because his wife loves to listen to live music. And it turns out live music is a hard problem. It's not really a web-centric problem because a lot of the bands nowadays that play these venues, they don't have websites. They don't bother. It's too hard. You know, I, I had one guy tell me because I, I saw this great band uh, down at the Crocodile in Seattle a few weeks ago. And I was like, I've never heard of you. you know, and I just did a, a, a Bing search. And I, and I can't find you. And he's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're you know, it's just Facebook. We're, that's all we do because it's easy. And it turns out a lot of bands just have Facebook pages. They don't have web pages at all. And I suspect, I haven't checked, but I suspect this might be, you know, an issue with, with, uh, with uh, other, other types of data as well, not just live music. And so Adam wrote this uh, program that scrapes all this stuff. It's a very smart crawler that walks around looking for live music locally. It renders the venues on the map and allows you to do the same thing, right? Click through, find what you want. And the cool thing about Adam's app is that if, if there's nothing on that Wednesday night when his wife wanted to go out, it'll just keep going to Thursday, Friday. And it, let's say he clicks something on Thursday then it will just change the reservation to Thursday and update his and his wife or whoever else they've invited's uh, uh, calendar, right? And so this is data, lots of data out there, but it's completely hidden within the interface of this super app. So I'm finished. I've introduced a lot of new terms today, uh, not all of them G-rated, and I've talked about how things are changing, that we have this perfect storm of innovation that's possible now between what PCs are becoming and the fact that we really don't need to search anymore because there's a bunch of things that we just know. It's causing these things like super apps to emerge because we can resolve intent in place. It's changing the way, I think, that we use our devices and that we use the knowledge of the world. And it represents an, a very huge opportunity for the people who own data to extract value out of that data for themselves as opposed to these master auctioneers uh, that have been collecting it up to now. There's a massive opportunity here for data curators, right? I'm expecting, somebody mentioned the World Cup in Brazil uh, next summer, you know, the people who can curate that data the best, that write the best crawlers and that provide answers, not just links, are going to have an opportunity to monetize that, that data uh, in ways that they're not able to do it now. All right, if you found this interesting, that's me on email, that's me on Twitter, and my blog uh, is at MSDN, uh, and I welcome questions. Thank you.